This is Paul Burnett interviewing uh, Bill Langer for the Global Mining and Materials Research Project of the Business Series of the Oral si History Center of the Bangkok Library. And it's Wednesday, February 18th, 2015. So welcome, Mr. Langer. Um, let's go to, we're start at the beginning here. So can you tell me a little bit about your family background and, uh, and where you grew up? Sure. My father was a college professor, chairman of the economics and business department at a small university in western New York. It's mm. Alfred University. Oh. Yeah, not many people hear of it, but yeah. in this business actually they do because it's uh, the, the country's number one ceramics college. Wow. And so miners here, they're involved in clay, right. will know about Alfred University. Most other places I go, they scratch their head and wonder where it is. <laughs> My mom was a stay-at-home mom. I had two sisters, both older than I am. Mm -hmm. The town's population was about a thousand. The two universities there, one university and one state college, the students way outnumbered the local residents. That's right. We had one stoplight, a very small town, had to go to a centralized school shared with another town because it was such a small uh, place we couldn't afford or, or couldn't maintain our own school. Mm -hmm. And where was the next biggest city uh, around there? Oh, well, the biggest biggest to us was Hornell, which nobody knows about either. It was 12 miles away, and it was a major chore at those days to, to, to take a ride into Hornell. Mm. Uh, my mom used to go grocery shopping, $20 food budget for the week, and we'd uh, drive into Hornell, and, and that was our trip to Hornell. <laughs> Anything else we needed, we better get that trip because we wouldn't go back for a week. <laughs> but the next real city was Rochester. And that's, we were at the southern end of New York State. Rochester was directly north of us. So okay. just drive south from Rochester till you hit the Pennsylvania border. Turn around, go back about 15, 20 miles, and you're in Alfred. All right, that's great. <laughs> um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you became interested in, uh, in geology and, and in mining? How yes. did that come about? Yes, I can. My dad, as I said, was a professor at Alfred, and, and that gave his, him the privilege of having his children attend that school at a reduced or no uh, tuition, depending on which choice he, he made, and his salary was adjusted accordingly. Mm -hmm. So for all of us, it was assumed that you went to grade school, junior high, high school, and college. There was, there was no question. I mean, right. it was just part of things. Right. And so when, we, uh, when I went to college, I, I went there without a career in mind. Mm -hmm. I just went because that's what you're supposed to do. Many of uh, the other students around me all uh, had some career that they were planning on. I, I didn't. It was just more school. Well, my junior year, at the beginning of my junior year, I had to declare a major. And the, I never really thought about what I'd do with a major, but the, the class that I had the most fun in turned out to be geology. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, what the heck? I'll, I'll do geology. So that's how I became a geologist at the earliest stage. Right. What was what was fun about it? Oh, uh, outside. Oh. We we did outdoors. We did, and my dad used to take me hunting and fishing and just hiking through the woods. And this was like a classroom where you where you got a grade for doing that. Right. So. Right. Did you have in mind that you were going to? Uh, uh, pursue academic geology, or were you thinking about a career in in, a, in in industry at that time? I hadn't even gotten that far. Okay. It was it was what I needed to do to graduate. I was in ROTC mm -hmm. and had elected to continue on and to be, uh, join the army when I finished, and so that was my job. Yeah. Uh, never viewed as a career, but that was my job. Right, right. And you're in ROTC at a very pivotal point in American history. Yes. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, it was during the Vietnam War, during the latter part of the Vietnam War, and it, it had become quite unpopular, uh, protests on campus. Um, even at Alfred? Even at Alfred, and we were, and we were quite backwards. Uh, um, we were way behind the times. But, but it had reached there. Uh, it was not a big deal. So you were speaking about um, 1969 in, in Alfred, and there were 
protests even at a small remote college town. Yes, there were. The, the, the graduation ceremony for the ROTC people was disrupted by, by protesters. Not a big deal. And, you know, the, the, the student population was not that big, and they had a hard time getting enough people together to even mount a halfway decent protest. But they did have, <laughs> have a representative group there that, that did nothing. Yeah. But, it, but it, it was a time where I pretty much assumed that uh, when I graduated, I would be drafted and go into the Army and go to Vietnam, so I might as well do it as an officer. Right, right. So I How did you I, feel about the protests at that time? It bothered me. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and so you graduated ROTC, and you were, you were drafted or you were... Uh, no, I was a volunteer. You were a volunteer. I, I, I received a commission. ROTC yep. gave me a commission. Mm -hmm. And I went right from graduation to my first assignment, which was to a training school where we learned the military aspects of our career mm -hmm. and chose a career. I mean, we were <laughs> given a particular career path. Did you take a number of tests for aptitude at various things? Uh, no, they obstacle. relied on your college education mm -hmm. and where they needed people. Uh -huh. And so for, for someone with a training in geology, where did you end up? I had hoped to end up in the Corps of Engineers, but I ended up in the Signal Corps. Okay. It had nothing to do with my training. That's where they needed a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, and I understand that you, you're a recipient of the Bronze Star Medal. Yes, I am. Can you talk about that? or? Well, I, I prefer not to talk too much about it, but let's say that in, in Vietnam, uh, there were some difficult times, and I uh, helped uh, resolve some of them. And, and it was not a medal for meritorious, or for uh, valor. Mm -hmm. It was for meritorious service. Okay. So it was not like I was running, you know, carrying wounded soldiers out of my back. But right. It was on a difficult times that I helped make better. It was, it was service. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so you uh, finished your service in 1971. So you were there for two years? Actually, I finished my service, uh, yes, in 71. Uh, no, I went, I went in uh, 69 to 70. Okay. I finished my service in 70, okay. mustered out directly from the Army, and eight days later showed up for graduate school. Okay. And so uh, you were, it was clear in your mind that geology was something you wanted to continue in. No. No? <laughs> Not yet. No. <laughs> uh, as I said, my dad taught economics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we communicated a lot uh, during, during the war mm -hmm. uh, and uh, during my deployment. And he found a college, a Northeastern University in Boston, that was offering a degree in CPA. Mm -hmm. uh, would you would graduate as a certified public accountant, mm -hmm. uh, and it was designed for people who had no experience at all or no training in economics or, or such. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, hey, this would be great geology, and that I could be a CPA for an oil company, a gold company. That'd, that'd be a good career path. Right. Sure. So I signed up, got to the class. First day in class, the professor said, "How many people have had at least one?" course in economics, mm -hmm. and I and everyone else raised their hands. And I said, well, that's okay. And the next question was, how many people had a minor in economics? Everybody except for me put their hands down. I put my hand down. The next question was, how many people have a major in economics? And all those that had their hand up left it up. Mm -hmm. And so the professor said, well, we're not going to start out at the beginning now. This is an advanced class. Mm -hmm. And so I was a beginning, beginner in an advanced class. They bought advanced textbooks. I had to buy advanced and introductory textbooks. <laughs> and I've never out. worked so hard in my life to get C's. Mm -hmm. After one semester, I said, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided, through an odd course of events, to become a geologist. Mm. So fate made me a geologist. That's not right. love, not planning, not anything else, just, just fate. That's a common trajectory for people. Fate, <laughs> fate does intervene in these, in these instances, uh, and oftentimes quite happily. Um, so it's, it's uh, 1972, and you graduate with a, a master's in geology. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, your first uh, position that you made use of this training? 
Yes, I was fortunate while in graduate school to have a professor who knew people that worked at the United States Geological Survey, USGS, and they had a need for an intern to help prepare some simple maps that translated geology into terms that regular people could understand. Mm -hmm. Mostly tracing lines on a geologic map right. and then putting new labels on their lines, sometimes combining two or three units mm -hmm. and uh, together as one. Yeah. And I was given that the, the opportunity and accepted to have that job. So I had a small paying job as an intern. When I graduated, it turned out that the person I was working with was opening up a new field office in Middletown, Connecticut. Mm. And they asked if I would be interested in going along. And I said, you bet. Great. I mean, because I had been sending out applications and uh, were receiving replies that were, you know, I was not real happy with some of, you know, some of them, yeah, we'll hire you, but, you know, you aren't going to like this job. Yeah. And this was one that I was already doing. I knew the person and I liked the work and so I went. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it was a job translating complicated geology into simple English. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, it's not, uh, not necessarily for the public, but it's for other uh, professional use perhaps that, um, that would, you know, they would need this uh, maybe for legal or city planning purposes. Absolutely. This was a time in the country's history when they were starting to realize that nature mattered. Rachel Carson had written her book, Silent Spring, and right. things were going bad. Love Canal was right. a disaster. Right. And so they said, gee, we cannot live in, in spite of geology or in spite of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to live in concert with it. And geology is one part of nature. And so this was the US, one of the USGS's first attempts to help provide meaningful uh, data into the land use planning process. Mm -hmm. And that's what this was all about. And indeed, the project that I was working on, we worked very closely with some planners and came up with new town plans of growth and development based on geology. Hmm. Can, you, can you give an example of how that might work in, in, the, in the planning of a town and respecting geology? Sure. The, the town that we did was in rural Connecticut, mm -hmm. and much of the town was uh, on the, in the east there are townships and there are villages, and their villages are little incorporated centers. Townships abut one another. There's no unincorporated counties in the east. And so this township was mostly rural. The village had sewer and water. The township had wells and septic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you don't want to do, of course, is have your well interfere with the septic or vice versa. Right. And so there are certain geologic materials that are better at communicating away the septic effluent or that are better uh, for providing wells. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of information was useful in helping plan where you might, the density of the, of the uh, development. Some soils, you can see, well, we can put houses closer together and the septic systems will still function well. Mm -hmm. But in other parts of the township, you better have acres between each lot. And so they came up with a development of a density map based on, on that. And it included other things like identifying and protecting wetlands, right. uh, identifying um, areas where it was steep slopes, where it might be in danger of rock falls or hazards like that. Mm -hmm. And even, I was delighted to see, even at the time, uh, places where it was reasonable to develop the, re to develop the resource as aggregate, as sand and gravel or crushed stone. Mm. They, they, rec they were forward with thinking enough at that time to recognize that we need construction materials and let's set aside a little place now. It wasn't quite that altruistic. There was a big existing quarry, right. and they realized they, they better not constrain that quarry so it couldn't do its job. Right. But they did, they did include it. Right. So that land use planning is both respectful of urban development, industrial development, and ecology. You have those three goals as part of the, part yes. of the planning. Yes. Right. right. And that's a... Um, well, we can talk about how those those priorities evolve uh, during the time of your 
of your uh, career. Uh, and so you did that for a number of years, not just in, uh, in the Northeast, or was it mostly in the Northeast? No, I worked for five years in the Northeast and then moved to the USGS headquarters in Reston, Virginia, which is in Northern Virginia, mm -hmm. and continued on the same type of project in a totally different geologic terrain. The Northeast is paleoglacial terrain. You could almost, it was it's, it's so young uh, glacially that you could almost see the ice left in the, in the gravel. <laughs> That's but, great. <laughs> but in, but in uh, the, the uh, Virginia area, it was so old, quite the opposite, right. that, that the, the uh, nature had plenty of time to weather the rocks into very soft uh, material quite different from a rock. And so 180 degrees as far as the type of material. And does that present different challenges for urban development and for, for uh, ecological um, planning and, and industrial development? So yes, it did. Quite different challenges. Uh, similar in that you, you wanted the same goals and you want, and, and there were similar engineering conditions in that you wanted a well-drained material for a septic system mm -hmm. as opposed to a tight clay and so forth. Um, but different challenges as far as how you interpreted the geology, mm -hmm. and also d uh, hugely different challenges for me. The, the, the first thing I did was recognize, my goodness, how much of this stuff, where is rock? <laughs> you know, it was weathered so deeply that you could hardly find the rock. Right. And I, I remember a, a fellow named Al Froelich, one, one of my first and best mentors, uh, Poor fellow smoked himself to death and left this earth way too early. But we were out in the field. He had a passion for geology, you wouldn't believe. And we're out in the field, and he has his rock hand, hammer in his hand. And we're going down this ravine, starting at the top, and he's banging on the soil, and it's going thump, thump, thump. And then we get a little farther, and it's going thump, thump. And then we get down, and there were little pieces of rock, what they call core stones. And he'd bang on that, and it would kind of go clunk. Mm -hmm. And he'd go thump, clunk. He's not saying anything. Not saying anything. Just doing this. And, and then we get a little deeper, we get down to the bottom and it goes bang, and it goes like that. And, and he said, it's ringing like the anvil chorus. I still remember him <laughs> saying that. And what he was showing me is how as you go down through the section, the rock is completely disaggregated, and then there's just little pieces of it floating around, and you get down to the bottom to the solid rock. And that was my introduction, and it just got better from there on. Is that a reference to La Traviata? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> so you, said, you have opera references as you are doing geology. This is this is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he he was a well balanced man. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, well rounded. Is yeah, important. Uh, he had other things to say. Uh, I love the guy. Um, he he, uh, uh, he shared my opinion, which was imparted on me by my dad, and that was that. Products work to be good should result in a meaningful, useful product. Mm -hmm. And in the USGS, as a research geologist, <clears throat> it was very easy to lose that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you could end up in research which may end up on a shelf, uh, doing research that could end up on a shelf and never see the light of day. Or 15, 20 years down the road, somebody will reference it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in another research study. But it n never makes it to where it's really used. And that's why I was fortunate to be in a project where the products were being used right away. That's right. what they were being done for. And Al shared that experience. And one of his critiques of his colleagues was that they used to like to see how many angels could dance on the head of a tourmaline crystal. <laughs> Well, it sounds like, um, I mean, this is knowledge for use, right? It, it has a, it, it, you want this to be of service to other, other people, other disciplines. Um, it sounds like it was also a little bit interdisciplinary. Were you working with other, uh, other experts in other areas to do this kind of work? Or Absolutely. Was it explicitly geology, or exclusively yeah. geology? No, in fact, the USGS had three disciplines at the time, uh, geology, hydrology, and topographic mapping and land use. And these projects were all designed to include all three of those disciplines. And we would work together, hand in hand, on the maps. We wouldn't each go off to our own corner mm -hmm. and, and work. And we produced a large number of maps 
that could not have been done if you did it by yourself. When you understand that how geology and water interact, you can make a better geologic map, you can make a better water-related map. Right. And then certainly when you knit them together at the planning stage. Now the next step, of course, involves the planners who include all of the cultural and socioeconomic parts. And that makes the waters even muddier. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found intriguing because many geologists would like to know how many angels could dance on the head of a tourmaline crystal. And you've got to identify those tourmaline crystals and you focus narrower and narrower and narrower. Yeah. This was just the op but a, but a very complicated, difficult process to learn the crystal structure and to learn the biology of an angel or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. But we had to go the other way, broader and broader and broader. And so as we're, as, as we're going on, rather than knowing everything about nothing, we start learning a little bit about everything. Mm -hmm. Is that more satisfying knowledge for you? More satisfying kind of work for you? For me, it, it truly was and continues to be. It's a, it's a totally different kind of puzzle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And was there any relationship between this kind of work and the Bureau of Land Use Planning? It just sounds like it might be, or does the Bureau of Land Use Planning have a very different mandate from, from the work that you were doing with USGS? Uh, different mandates. Yeah. It's much more uh, legal and yes. political. Regula regulatory. regulatory. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, so this was an enjoyable uh, uh, few years that you were, you were taking on these uh, challenges. And that was until the late 70s, until the 1978, I think. Until 1981, actually. Until 1981, yeah. okay. Well, 78 doing, doing the, hard, uh, the hardcore field work related right. stuff. Yeah. And I, I'd like to interject during that time, uh, I met Steve Overmeyer, and a bona fide engineer, and the USGS did not have many of those. He <laughs> may have been the only one. <laughs> and he looked at things quite differently yet. He looked at how you could take soils and squeeze them and find out how strong they're going to be and, and uh, uh, put holes in them and see if the holes are going to close and pull it, stretch on them and right. do all this kind of engineering stuff. Yeah. And we worked together on a number of projects where I knew the geology and I could tell him where these clays of a certain type were and he could say, these are bad clays. This, If you put a house on this and start watering a lawn, the house is going to slide down the hill. And there were some very real problems in Northern Virginia about that type of ground failure. And, and Steve was one of the leaders in, in, in uh, working with finding ways to deal with it. And you don't commonly deal with it by outdoing nature. You deal with it by working with late nature. And together, we put out a, a very handsome report that included the geology about where you might want to watch out for this kind of stuff. And, and the engineering side about why you want to watch out for it. Right, right. And was this taken up by planners and developers in Absolutely. that area? Absolutely. Yeah. And there were uh, very serious uh, land use constraints put on things where the counties didn't want to get involved with, it, with big messy suits where houses were sliding down the hill and they had permission from the county to put their house there. And so now whose fault is it? Right. And so they didn't like that kind of problem. And, and this kind of work had direct application. And, and for how long had the USGS been involved in that kind of work? Was this fairly new? Fairly new. It started in, in the 70s. Wow. Wow. Um, I guess it's part of the general regulatory push in the, in the 70s towards uh, safety and uh, uh, the, the, the health and safety, I guess, yes. <laughs> is the, yep. and, and ecology and, and the environmental, uh, environmental uh, soundness and health. Well, and then there were, con there were groups that were concerned about how long our resources were yeah. going to last. And there were publications saying that we're going to run out of copper and gold and lead in so many years. If you look at the population growth, and it, it was not called sustainability at the time, mm -hmm. but you know, are we going to be able to sustain this life? Yeah. And most of their projections, all of their projections were off the mark. I right. mean, we're still here today, and we wouldn't have been if those had come true. Right, right. That's an interesting period in, 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 in history. Uh, you have the, 
the popular books coming out, like the Population Bomb, like uh, that, uh, and the Club of Rome's 1972 report, which is just a series of charts showing, you know, for each element, and each right. each natural resource and energy resource, with a with a graph going straight down towards the future, you know, uh, an inevitable, very very rapid decline, that as you say did not uh, pan out. Um, uh, but how did, how did those big, those are popular, I mean, these are part of the popular culture. Um, and this is something that affected and influenced the work of the government. This, this spurred the kind of work that you were doing to sort of, we need to get a handle on, on uh, resources and resources, information about resources need to be made available to the, to the public so they can make informed decisions. Is that part of the, part of the piece? Yes, yes, it is. And and the, the Club of Rome was one of the, the driving forces. Now, the USGS never got involved in the debate. Mm -hmm. Our our role was to provide data and to provide reliable, I hate to say honest, truthful data, but unbiased, I'll mm -hmm. use that term, right. reliable, unbiased data. And that put us in a, in a good position because we would get calls from engineering, groups, engineering associations asking to give papers, and we'd get called from groups uh, like Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. to give presentations. Mm -hmm. and, and they all valued our data. And I was going to say our opinions, but we weren't really allowed to have opinions, but we were allowed to, to just show the data and what and the trends that we saw with the data, but we wouldn't project and say this is what's going to happen. We're, we would be very willing to say this is what happened in the past, and we would be very willing to say, here are examples of what happens if you um, don't shepherd your resources well. Right, right. Uh, and so in this period from 78 to 81, uh, you're a senior research geologist for aggregate resources at the Office of <coughs> Land Information and Analysis. So this is this kind of unit that you're talking about that, that uh, has interdisciplinary research to, to uh, uh, that applies interdisciplinary research to land use questions, basically. Yes. Uh, what happened was I had been doing the field work, so I was part of a program that was called uh, uh, Regional Geology, or the thing at the time I think their name was off a branch of environmental geology because environment was the keyword of the day. Yeah. And I was thoroughly enjoying the field work. But the USGS needed some help encouraging more of that kind of work because it was being done in a very small part of the survey. And so I decided uh, upon encouragement of and being recruited by others to join a more management related aspect of it where, where I would uh, fund programs that, that did, this kind of, did this kind of work. I'd encourage others to do it and then find means for them to get the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And although I agreed completely with their goals and the mission of that group, I found it difficult in, in, in the morning to come in and have an in, ba in, an in basket and an out basket. And in the morning it was here and in the night it was here. And that was my measure of success for the day. Now as a geologist, I could say I put down 15 test holes today mm -hmm. or I mapped 83 miles of contact, or maybe I mapped one mile of extremely difficult contact, but I had feedback every single day. Yeah. And, and shoveling from one box to the other didn't help, and so what I had to do was live vicariously through the results yeah. of others. When they got, when their project was finished, I could say, hey, I helped fund that. I yeah. helped them get the money. Right. That that didn't quite do it for me. Yeah. Um, I, 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 appreciate the opportunity to do that work, and uh, I think I had a positive impact, but it was not the same. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, you were interested more in kind of solving puzzles or mysteries, and right. you, it's kind of, de you're kind of describing detective work. It's kind it of is, like, it you is. Know, uh, so it has that kind of excitement built into it, and so this was more of a supervisory position uh, uh, a, a research evaluation position, and so you're 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 looking at the work of others, and it's not as not as satisfying for you. Correct. Um, so, 
how did you how did you cope? What were the next steps then for you? Well, the next step actually was a, a, a great one. Um, they liked what I was doing and wanted to now try to encourage the same kind of work in the Western USGS offices. And so they set up an office for me and I was transferred to Denver mm -hmm. from Reston, Virginia. And that in itself was huge. Um, didn't have any idea what it would be like. I'd spent my entire life in the East and uh, sh showed up in Denver in February, dirty, dull, you know, I mean, blue skies, but the ground is just all bare, no grass, no no snow, right. just, and it was like, you know, and Pam and I look at each other, what have we gotten ourselves into? This is your but, wife, Pam. Yeah. <laughs> my wife, Pam, yeah. But wow. Uh, and then, no sooner than we get got here, then the bottom fell out of the environmental um, work in the USGS. The director at the time said, this is very important work, but we don't need separate groups doing it. We will roll all of this work back into the divisions. Mm -hmm. And so here I am, one, one year out here, ready to start up a new thing, and the rug is out from under me. Oh. Uh, and yeah. So I had a choice of where I would go back to the geology group type of work that I was doing, mm -hmm. or hydrology. Those were my two disciplines because I, in graduate school I had a, a, a strong uh, background in hydrology. And I decided the hydrology folks looked like they were a little more on board mm -hmm. than, than the geology ones. It looked like the geology folks wanted to get back to mapping and forget this. And the hydrology folks generally have a very applied driven effort anyway. Mm -hmm. you know, they're looking for water, not out of scientific research, but you know, where is their water? We right. need water. Right. Now, they do have the research that say, how does that water move through the ground? How difficult is it to get out? Um, you know, and that kind of uh, issue, but one of the bottom lines is, where is it and can we get it? And, and let's, we need it now. We, right. we want it in our sink. Yeah. And so I chose to go with that group. Mm -hmm. And that was in, uh, what year was that? Well, let's see, we moved out in 81, so that was probably 82. Mm -hmm. And so you became the research geologist slash hydrologist. Yes. At this, at this, uh, at this division. Yes. Um, and it lists a number of things that you did uh, along the same lines of what you described before. That this is, this is um, urban geology, as you described it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of work that you were doing uh, in the 1980s? Yes. Um, urban geology might be a, a. It's a general approach. It's it's applied geology, mm -hmm. but. In the 80s, another issue that the country was trying to cope with was what to do with the radioactive waste that we're generating from nuclear generation facilities. Yeah. And the country was trying to, uh, to deal with this in an orderly manner. Mm -hmm. And so the first goal was, well, let's divide the United States up and find 11 or 12 areas that might be useful in tremendous different geologic uh, terrains and, and different types. Do we want to bury it deep in the ground in a hard crystalline rock, or do we want to put it over in some shallower place here in a different kind of rock? Uh, um, where do we want it to go? Yeah. And there was a subgroup of that called Task One, and the first task being to find out where this might go. Mm -hmm. Well, for various reasons, probably politically driven, it's, it soon became obvious that looking throughout the entire U.S. was not going to work. And so task one was refocused to say, let's look at three potential sites. Hanford, Washington, Yucca Mountain, Nevada, and a, a place in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so the effort was, well, well we will look in, in the, let me step back. Sure, sure. Uh, before they got quite that uh, pointed, mm -hmm. they said, well, let's, let's, look out, let's look through the entire basin and range as task one, and we will look in other physiographic provinces as time allows. Mm -hmm. We'll start out there because it's dry. It would be a good place because there's not going to be water moving it. And so our goal was to find places 
in the basin and range, a variety of places, using the same technique that you'd use to find out where's a good place to put a septic system. Right. Entirely different criteria, right. of course. Right. But using the same general technique, mixing water, hydrology, topography, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And as we got into that, that's when politics took over and said, well, quit looking for any place here. Focus on these three sites. Mm -hmm. And so we did that, and no sooner did we get well along in that path than politics took over and said, we're just going to look at Yucca Mountain now. And who knows why, but the fact that Nevada had two senators and two Congress party people might have been something to do with it. I <laughs> never knew that about the siting efforts for Yucca Mountain. That I, you know, the story that I had heard was that, that there was this grand search among expert geologists who scoured the earth and, and the United States specifically um, for the ideal sites that had to be geologically inert. They had all these criteria they had to fit and there were candidates that were eliminated and the one that was left was Nevada. And you're saying that it was actually, no, we weren't even consulted <laughs> as to. That's it's, right. The, what you were uh, led to believe is not quite right. Okay. That's no, it was It was for... Uh, I was not part of the decision-making uh, process, so it's speculative for me to say it was political. Mm -hmm. there, there may have been perhaps somebody behind the magic curtain right. did look, but no, we were not. We were involved in trying to find sites, and I'll tell you, we had found a, a, a dozen sites in the Basin Range that, that looked like they would be good, one of which in, in, was the Yucca Mountain site. Mm -hmm. But we never got to the stage of saying, how are we going to narrow the field? Right. How, and that's where we were just getting. And computers, uh, small desktop computers, mm -hmm. were just becoming popular. And it gave us a whole new uh, way to manipulate large amounts of data. Yeah. Uh, and, and we were just getting set up to use those to try to uh, un unravel this mystery. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, all of a sudden, we're told, "No, this is this is where it's going to go." What year did, were you informed of the project to begin doing basic research on siting for the nuclear waste disposal? You mean for the narrowed down to Yucca Mountain part, mm -hmm. or for Just the, the whole the very beginning of the whole project, as far as you know, uh, and your involvement? I my involvement started in 1982 when 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 my the group I was going to be with was dissolved. They had been already doing this in, and we're still at the many, uh, many places throughout the U.S. stage. Right. In fact, I was part of a team that, that went to a number of meetings looking at, at discussing what we were doing in Yucca Mountain versus what other people, or not in Yucca Mountain, in the Basin Range mm -hmm. versus what other people were doing in other parts of the country. So it was still alive at that level, but the emphasis ended up being put on it, on the Basin Range, perhaps because we had so much data, mm -hmm. there'd been a lot of work there before for us to draw upon, mm -hmm. uh, or just perhaps we were doing a good job, or perhaps because that's the type of terrain that someone had decided. But they were talking about deep crystalline rock repositories in the east, I mean, burying them in deep, deep holes under in, underground where water might never make its way. but. Those disappeared for strange reasons, mm. and and we were left with a basin and range for about five years, and and then that one disappeared. And each of these events were overlapped. Mm -hmm. So while we were looking at the the th the entire U.S., the basin and range took on a life of its own. Yeah. And then while we were looking at the basin and range, Yucca Mountain started a bigger life on its own. Mm -hmm. While while we were still ostensibly trying to find the best place in the basin range, one of those had already taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so many parameters that go into calculating because nuclear waste disposal, you're talking, I don't know what the years that this chamber had to be uh, intact for, but 90,000 or something like that? Some, oh, some kind of... uh, an outrageously long time. Right. It was, oh, we want to bury this and make sure it's uh, safe, in, essentially in perpetuity with with no recognition that uh, over time, technology would get better. Um, it, it may be something even worth going back and recovering in the future. Right. Uh, right. Or certainly if we found out how to do it better, 
moving it to a better location in the future, have it as a more temporary place there. there. It's a very complicated business. I, I was not involved in, in any of those decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. Um, but from my perspective, uh, uh, we could have done a good job with a geologic search, and, and we just never completed that effort. Yeah. And then, as you say, they, they, the, the candidate, Yucca Mountain, was decided upon, and they, they drilled, I understand, and built uh, uh, you know, access roads and, and built the chambers inside the mountain. They got all that stuff ready. And then there was another change that happened. Can you talk about what the eventual fate of Yucca Mountain? I've not been involved in it, but basically it's no longer a candidate. Yeah. Um, now, in defense of my organization, we did not make the decisions about w where we would be doing our research. I believe the Department of Energy, perhaps with input from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, mm -hmm. uh, made those kinds of decisions. Yeah. Um, we just moved our research to where we were, were told. We were trying to do good scientific reports mm -hmm. as part of this process. Um, and we even had some difficulty in doing that because the uh, Department of Energy wanted information on a timeline that we weren't quite used to. We had a very rigid review and approval process and then we would generally publish our reports in peer-reviewed literature to stand up to the criticism of others if it was there. Mm -hmm. And that took a long time, and it did not meet some of the timeline criteria of the Department of Energy. And so after I left that project, and it had nothing to do with me leaving, but yeah. after I left, it evolved to where they were doing mostly administrative reports rather than traditional USGS reports. Mm -hmm. And when it came time in some of the final evaluation, those administrative reports didn't have the pedigree and didn't, with, didn't stand up to the criticism mm -hmm. or to the critique. And so they were not as val considered not as valid. Now, they were probably done just as carefully, yeah. but, but they did not carry the prestige wisdom with them that a traditional USGS report would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I think the, the sighting was not the, the big issue. The, the political football was the transshipment. How do you get the, the, the nuclear waste from the plants to Yucca Mountain? And states were like, you're not taking this through our backyard. Uh, and that ended up you know, killing it in the end, uh, or one of the factors that killed it. Well, yes, and transportation would be one. But, but you used, I think, the, the key phrase, not in this backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, not in my backyard, NIMBY became the rallying cry for many, many things, including opponents to the mining industry. Right. And this is a, um, uh, this is a big, I was going to say watershed, but we probably shouldn't use those terms <laughs> and be that punny. Uh, but uh, it, there's a, a tremendous environmental regulation that, that uh, is, is put in place uh, starting in the 1970s, but uh, there's an awareness that, that there needs to be some responsibility on the part of, of industry to clean up uh, 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 ecosystems that have been damaged by, by work, even if they didn't do the initial pollution, if whoever owns it ends up being uh, responsible. So I imagine, did that affect some of the work that you were doing and have an impact on, on what you were doing? Absolutely. Uh, Cleanup is an issue. Uh, we don't really, uh, we did not get directly involved in cleanup, although there would be cases where the hydrology group that I used to be with would study the, the uh, extent of damage. They would put out monitoring wells and they would determine which way the, the, the uh, plumes, uh, contaminant plumes, would be traveling. And, and, and in that case, they would actually predict using geologic modeling or hydrologic modeling where those plumes might continue to go when you might expect them to, to daylight or to enter some well field or, or something of that type. But what also came about was uh, more opposition to having the things, yeah. kind of an assumption that any land use now was going to result in a problem. 
If you put a landfill any place, it's going to be a problem. If you put nuclear waste any place, it's going to be a problem. If you put a septic system in any place, if you put a mine in any place, mm -hmm. it will create a problem. And, and part of that was because prior to the 70s, people didn't know any better. Yeah. People didn't know any better, and so they, uh, or, uh, they were allowed to do activities. There was no government control, mm -hmm. but they didn't, they didn't know it. I mean, in Alfred, when I was a kid, my job once a week was to go out back and burn the papers, yeah. open burning, yeah. and that was my job. Yeah. I remember how fun it was to throw a, a uh, shaving can cream in and watch it explode <laughs> from a distance. But, but that was my job, to, yeah. to burn the paper. Well, open burning is no longer an acceptable way to do things. Yeah. We separated our glass and our, our trash. Um, we, we recycled newspaper, so we were ahead of the times there. But the garbage man would come by, and our wet garbage, they'd come by with a, with a uh, manure spreader pulled by a tractor, at first a horse, but later on a tractor, and throw the wet garbage in that, take it up in the fields, and spread it out on the fields. Wow. That was all, that, yeah. We'd go to the dump. We didn't have a landfill. We had a dump. Mm -hmm. And I said, my dad used to take me honey. We'd go plinking. We'd have a 22 and set up little bottles at the edge of the dump and shoot them uh, shoot the rats. Right, right. You know, that were in, I mean, and we'd find good stuff up there that somebody set aside when they went to the dump and they knew it wasn't trash, so they didn't heave it over the edge. Right. They just set off the side and we said, hey, we, we could use that, that old chair. We'd so that's not, up. yeah, that's not burial. That's no. just open, an open it's, pit. It's an open pit. And, and we did just heave things over the edge. Yeah. All the trash just got pushed over the edge. That was not a sanitary landfill by any means. Yeah. And nobody, nobody knew any better. Mm -hmm. Well, now that would be a terrible place, but I mean, and then it turned out to be a terrible thing. The runoff in that stream, the, the creek that was down below, I sure wouldn't want to do anything with, with that. Right. And we learned better. Yeah. But the assumption was if you put in a dump in the, in, the, in the 80s, it was going to look like the one that they constructed in the 60s or 50s when I was a kid. Yeah. And that was an improper assumption. Yeah. But it took over, and it became the driving force of a lot of land use decisions. Yeah, I mean, it was it was in the air. I mean, there were those those television commercials from the '70s featuring the American Indian who's riding his horse through the wild, and and then he comes to a the top of the hill and he looks out and he looks mm -hmm. over a big garbage dump and there's the tear going down his mm -hmm. eye and there's that that kind of uh, environmental consciousness raising was was in full force in the '70s and by the '80s there was Earth Day was a big annual mm -hmm. occurrence and and and. Yep. and Environmental consciousness was being part of school curricula and things like that. So, and a good thing. Yeah, sure. And a good absolutely. thing. It's not bad. That yeah. was a good thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, so some of some of the work that you were doing was uh, a, around that in, to, to some extent. Well, it was, uh, especially the the prior to the uh, the nuclear waste disposal. It was okay. We do need resources. How can we, we do need to live on the earth. How can we have our footprint be minimized? How can we tread lightly right. on the earth and, and, and look out and, and not ruin things? Uh, the USGS never argued that the, uh, we, we didn't need some kind of regulations and didn't need to take care of things. We, in fact, I was part of an, an uh, I was one author of many of a, of a watershed <laughs> document that the USGS produced in uh, the early 80s called Nature to be Commanded. Mm -hmm. And it's part of Francis Bacon, right. Bacon's speech, Nature to be Commanded must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. And this was were a collection of case examples of how you could use geology, hydrology, and understanding of nature and could live within the boundaries set by that. Mm -hmm. But the, one of the troubles is that when people have, oppose something nearby, the rules don't count anymore. Mm -hmm. Even the natural rules, it, it becomes NIMBY, not, it, not in my backyard. Right. And right. the only way to, to stop things is, may not be through a real sound understanding of the conditions. It's through more arm waving and screaming and, and, and uh, loud protests. Mm -hmm. And the local activism had the effect of, of just displacing it to areas with less social and economic power, presumably, right? So yes. if people yeah. say, not in my backyard, then they'll find 
a backyard where the people are transient or they have less power or you know and and then there's a there's an equity issue there i suppose you know? absolutely the corollary to not in my backyard is in somebody else's in somebody backyard. else's backyard and, and it's going to go happen. somewhere and somebody else's backyard may not be the best backyard yeah yeah and there's well that's a that's an interesting uh reflection and so there's the the decisions that are being made are not uh it, well, some scientifically informed decisions are also social and politically informed decisions. In other words, that there's you know the, the, that that uh, there's a balance of considerations that that take place, and sometimes the best engineering proposition is not accepted because of this kind of political controversy. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, one of the Interesting. Well, there's a there's a, a, a kind of subset here in uh, in, the, in the getting into the 90s. There's this uh, Missouri River Basin project that you were involved in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, when the Yucca Mountain effort was winding down, or at least for me, uh, I was able to transfer back to the group that I used to be with that did geology. Mm -hmm. And so I became, instead of a hydrologist, I became a geologist again. Right. Uh, and at that time, once again, they decided, what are, what are we going to do that, that really demonstrates the value of geology? And a large part of the, the U.S. that had been relatively ignored in recent years by geologists uh, was the basin, it was the uh, uh, Missouri River Basin. And they were begging people to do something there. And I said, hey, I, I could do something there. And so the first thing I did was form a coalition of the, I believe there were seven or a dozen state geologists along the Missouri River. I could count them, but it's not worth the time. Uh, along the Missouri River. And we decided, let's, let's start out and figure what kind of natural issues are there to deal with in the Missouri River Basin. Well, as luck or Mother Nature may have it, uh, the, 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 great mis med the great Midwestern flood of 1993 mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And that opened up and said, well, that's one of the problems. And along with that, there's all the other socioeconomic problems that are, that are associated, uh, or I mean, geologic problems associated with uh, developing areas. And uh, a largely rural, largely our agricultural area, and so you find the problems of pesticides, herbicides, mm -hmm. and um, problems of waste disposal in areas that aren't sewer and so forth. So, right. forth. so and you find ex little tiny exploding population centers. Mm -hmm. And so how do we handle all that? And so um, amongst all the state geologists, we, we, we lined up three areas that, that looked like they would be good to, to study. Uh, one around Iowa uh, City. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Iowa Sioux City. City. Uh, hmm? Sioux City? Or? Sioux City. Yeah. Sioux City. Uh, one uh, in St. Joe, and then uh, one on the other side of the river in Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. these, were, these appeared to be areas where the population growth would be becoming heavy and that we could use uh, good effort. Well, funds never covered all of those, and so we narrowed it down to, well, we'd, we'd take off in, in St. Joe. And I was fortunate enough to be the geologist that got to work in St. Joe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as luck would have it, the geologic work got done, which was a hoot. I love doing geology. Mm -hmm. And it was a, yet another completely different area. I was in New England where the, ge where the glacial geology was fresh. I was in Virginia where the rocks were old and tired and weathered and beat up. And in St. Joe, it was largely influenced by glaciers, but the glaciers were half a million or years older, and so there'd been plenty of time for nature to rework everything, and it doesn't look like a freshly glaciated terrain anymore. Mm -hmm. So yet another geologic challenge, mm -hmm. which made it fun. Yeah. But when that was done, there was really no effort, and unfortunately, no real desire by the town folk in 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 uh, St. Joe to use the data. Yeah, I came in with with maps that 
showed in simple terms what they could do and the, the planning development guy pointed it out in the wall and said, well, here are the, here are the developments we have and they're approved and what can you do with, well, how can you help me now? They're, they're approved. Right. And I said, well, are you expecting any in the future? And he said, well, I don't know. Um, but these are what we're dealing with. Right, right. And so, although it was fun, it was back to the traditional geologic mapping, which I, I enjoyed, but was it missed that challenge of how do you bring all this together to something useful. Yeah, I mean, that's so much of the, the history of, of U.S. government scientific research is, is finding a service angle, like the, the agricultural experts, the extension service. So you'd go out and you'd demonstrate the value of the work, and then the, the customer, so to speak, would come to you, the citizen, uh, the farmer, would come and ask. Uh, they'd, be, they'd know they could go to their state or county uh, extension agent. And I guess there wasn't... These are almost sound like pilot projects for something that doesn't quite get off the ground. Is that fair? Absolutely. In fact, they were called pilot. They, they were routinely called pilot projects yeah. with, with no thought of what would happen after the pilot film went out. I and mean, if you look at a yeah. pilot TV program, yeah. if it works good, they turn it into a series. Yeah. This one was it's going to be a pilot, and whether it's good or not, that'll be it. Right. It shows what we can do. But let's go back to doing what we do best. Which is unfortunate. I mean, the, the, the whole piece of it is that you need extension. You need to, you need to demonstrate the use, right? To, that, to was, get that was my your, belief. Your belief. still is. Yeah. And, and, my, and my goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, so, and, and it had worked. You had experienced yes. uh, the, the joy of being useful and of service and that, that, that people were able to, to make use of the work that you'd done. And that's... Of course, mm -hmm. satisfying. Absolutely. Um, uh, the next phase is this uh, Colorado Front Range Infrastructure Resources Project. Yeah. Uh, is that another kind of pilot project, or is it something different? You're the senior research geologist for this, and this is 1996. Yes. Through to the end of the decade. That 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 uh, was great. Okay. <laughs> what, great. What happened? There were budgeting problems, and Congress or OMB or somebody, again, I'm not involved at that, I was never involved at that level, decided that they would yank away $2 million from the minerals program. Mm. Just take that money away. And the director gasped and said, well, how about if we come up with a project to use that money that would really demonstrate the value of the work that we're doing, and not only demonstrate it, but would implement it. Mm -hmm. And they bought it. Nice. And, the, and so a call was put out to people to uh, uh, send in application or proposals for this kind of study. And a group of us, hydrologists, geologists, and topographers, put in a proposal for the Front Range Urban Study. And what that was, was we would look at all of the natural resources along the Front Range and how uh, the need for them, where they're coming from, where they're going, including aggregates, water, other mineral resources, and how the topography and the land use growth affects all of that. Mm -hmm. And they selected our project. And that became then that, that project with a five-year time frame to, to implement it and saved the, the USGS from losing a couple million dollars yeah. and gave us the basis for a good project. Yeah. And, and a little bit more about the, the history, when that finished, that same two million dollars then came up for grabs and people liked the work, work that was done so much that it was extended another five years in a, in a, to, to broaden the study to look at more detail on the other industrial minerals. Yeah, brilliant. 